This is The Move. I'm Ayushi Roy. I'm Susan McDowell. You're listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> so with us today is Sasha Costanzo, who's associate professor at MIT in civic media and also co-founder of the Design Justice Network. Design Justice explicitly says, well, not only do we want to pay attention mm -hmm. to the values in the objects and systems that we're designing, but here's the set of values that we believe in. So, Sasha, hi. Welcome. Hello. Hi, how are you? It's good to have you here. You know, when we were starting out this series, I was telling Aisha that we needed to invite you here. We were doing a whole list of people we wanted to have on our initial series, and you were at the top of the list. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is true. No, I said, I know. So you I still are at the top of our Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> well, now I'm embarrassed, but thank you. <laughs> well, part of it is because, you know, you may not remember this, but one of the ways I came to work with you is because of uh, the platform you had developed called Vojo, which we use for this campaign in Cambridge around domestic violence. And that whole Vojo platform is, you know, really it's a voice-based media platform that allows people to call into a number and use text messages and organize information and stuff. But what I loved about it is that where it came from, right? Because it came from your work in L.A. Uh, you had built this software called Volsmob that you actually did through a participatory design project with day laborers and household workers oh, wow. and the Institute for Popular Education. And just that whole frame that you have of working both with the end users around the design and creating systems that really bring design and, you know, I mean, digital and analog together are really right on point for what we're trying to think about here today. Now, what was really interesting about that project, in addition to that whole process, was the core group, which was called the Popular Communication Team, would take stories that were coming in and being posted to the platform, review them, edit them, find the most powerful ones, download them, and then follow up with the creators to expand them into stories that would go into the print newspaper. That oh, would cool. then be printed mm -hmm. and circulated throughout Los Angeles, at the day labor centers, at community events, and on buses. And then the print newspaper, of course, had the number that you could call to post new stories or comment on the stories in the print publication. So it was really a, a cross-platform project that was deeply linked with a community-based organizing process that had deep roots in this particular neighborhood in Los Angeles. It's not just a software project. This is really a, a really important because we, we talk a lot about the importance of working and designing for the, both the analog and the digital world is how we call dealing with this cross-platform. I'm curious, just even from doing that and from where you are now, do you see a lot of people really working that way, trying to bridge purposely those two worlds together? Not as much as we really need. I think that a lot of the energy and excitement around design work and certainly software and technology development remains very lab-based, remains very linked to an imaginary or a discourse of the sort of brilliant creators who are going to come up with a wonderful idea and implement it, then get venture capital backing and roll it out upon the world, which is not to say that processes can't work that way. Sometimes they do. That is a, a widespread type of design practice. But I think that there is an interesting shift happening over time where even in the private sector and even in the Silicon Valley spaces, you do have an increasing turn to people thinking about human-centered design, lean design and development processes, the idea that you really need to get products in front of the intended end users as early and as frequently in the process as possible to validate the assumptions that you have about what people are going to want to do. That's good, and I see that as a positive turn. So away from waterfall to agile, that's important. The challenge is that that process is still often used in an extractive mm -hmm. design structure. So communities may be included earlier on and more frequently in design processes, but they still become spaces to gather raw material mm -hmm. for potential product ideas that then will be sold back to them, rather than thinking about the full spectrum of what would it mean to not only get ideas from end users, but actually figure out how are they going to materially and symbolically benefit from the products that we develop together. So what would it mean to share credit in terms of who's an innovator or a creator with quote-unquote end users or with citizens or with people, <laughs> with human beings? <laughs> or what would it mean to share the material 
benefits. So if, is there going to be a profit sharing arrangement with this community uh, or community based organization that you've included in a design process to come up with a, a new product idea? Myself and a growing network of people who talk about this in terms of design justice are interested in pushing that idea forward mm -hmm. and growing a community of people who would say, it's not only that we want human-centered design and lean development processes because it will produce better, more usable products, although that's true. It's also that we believe that we have an ethical commitment to share the discursive and material benefits and ownership over products and projects and processes that come from design more broadly. Wow. I really like the idea of graying the line between the creator and the user or the designer and the designee, if that's, I don't think that's a real word, but <laughs> I'm just making this up. I really like that because something we've been talking about in a previous episode was about the relationship between public servants and residents of that community and really thinking about the way in which sometimes or often the people who work in those municipal government agencies are members of the community. And so then are both residents and those serving. And to create this dichotomy really simplifies the degree to which a lot of social issues permeate communities or how they impact communities and how they should be treated with accordingly. And I think the way that you're getting to that from the design perspective is just so powerful. I'm from Silicon Valley. I'm a San Jose native from before it was called Silicon Valley. And <laughs> it's frustrating to watch a lot of the ways in which designers or engineers or coders now see themselves, kind of like you said, as the master of the rollout, right, as opposed to a co-creator even though human-centered design is becoming a thing and design thinking is becoming a thing and systems thinking, but there's no ethical component to that necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And to some degree, even in, and in this is an interesting conversation, so even in values-driven design mm -hmm. or in the values in design movement, on the positive side, you have more people starting to explicitly talk about what are the values that we're encoding in the affordances of the objects that we're creating or in the interface design and a little bit people talking about who's going to benefit from the design to object or system. At the same time, many people who use that framework stop at saying what's important here is that you make the values explicit. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's descriptive framework more than a normative framework. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say these are the values that we should hold mm -hmm. as designers. And so one of the differences between design justice as a framework and the values in design conversation is that design justice explicitly says, well, not only do we want to pay attention mm -hmm. to the values in the objects and systems that we're designing, but here's the set of values that we believe in. Mm -hmm. And so people who are using the design justice framework are talking explicitly about the structures of oppression and marginalization that shape people's life chances and access to resources, power, visibility, livelihood, health outcomes, and so on. So in other words, we're talking explicitly about what Patricia Hill Collins, who wrote Black Feminist Thought, names as the matrix of domination, mm -hmm. which is the intersecting lines of white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and settler colonialism, and to which we could also add ableism, discrimination based on citizenship status, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But the idea is we know a lot from sociology and from a number of other fields there are a number of large structures that intersect, that shape people's lives. And we've talked about that a lot in terms of how that shapes people's access to education, how it shapes the way different people might pass through or not pass through the criminal justice system or the prison system, and so on and so forth. But I think what's happening now is a lot of people are beginning to talk about, well, what does this mean in terms of design mm -hmm. as process and also as outcome. So how does the matrix of domination structure both design processes and products? And how could we rethink processes and products so that they would actively challenge rather than reproduce, usually unintentionally, right. white supremacist, heteropatriarchy, <laughs> capitalism, settler colonialism, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I really do too. And uh, I was just going to say that your last comment about sometimes unintentionally people create this, I think there's a lot of intentionality around it now. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, people really are trying to create these systems of separation in our society. I mean, there's purposeful movements around it now. And I think as we get clearer about what the other side of that story is, 
these other ways of looking at things, that rears his head more because I guess we've created the context for the dialogue. <laughs> it's what, what we've done, right? Absolutely. That's so interesting. So yeah, I always try and nod to the way that like most of the design processes that reproduce these structures, it, it often is unintentional, but I think that you're absolutely right to pause that for a moment and say, well, we, we can talk about ways that people are intentionally engaging in design to reproduce inequality. We could talk about, I don't know, let's talk about the construction of the border wall, right? That would be an example. <laughs> so here's a situation where the Trump administration and Department of Homeland Security put out a bid with requirements for firms to say they had a design showcase of, I forget the exact number, but I don't know, eight to 10, or maybe it was a little more, firms created demo design segments of the border wall. And each one actually built a segment, and then they had a review, they had a crit, <laughs> right? Yes. They yep. had a conversation about- uh, Urban design skills coming back. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> about which of these is, is the best, and it's the mix of the price point with the features of the oh, object man. that's been constructed. <laughs> and so here's a place where you could even say, let's do this border wall construction from a human-centered design <laughs> approach, right? And so right. what would that look like? You would say, well, let's map out the ecosystem of stakeholders. We have uh, border patrol agents who are tasked with doing a certain thing. We have migrants who are trying to cross. We have a whole set of stakeholders. You could imagine running human-centered design <laughs> workshops to create a border wall that would be human-centered, and that would probably produce a bunch of features that would make it more usable by the border patrol agents who right. have a difficult grueling job to be out there tasked with implementing their, their work. Again, so design justice as a framework is invested in saying, how can we build an approach to design that wouldn't let you do that? That would say, <laughs> if you're using this approach and following this set of steps, it will force you to step out and question what is the larger structure that this thing that you're building is going to be reinforcing? Now, the critique of that would, would be to say, well, you know, maybe you would say, given that there's going to be a border wall built, we want to build the wall with long-distance sensors that can see people's body heat and can tell when someone's about to die and would then send an alert and would thereby somehow save lives, right. right? But that would be narrowing your scope to saying, well, what is the function of the border wall initially? Mm -hmm. It's political theater that pushes people's crossing point further out from cities and more easily accessible locations out into more dangerous crossing locations and increases death rates as migrants come seeking both asylum and economic opportunity. And so you would say your design solution here is to not build a wall, not to build a more human-centered wall. That's an extreme example, right? right? But that framework of saying to what degree 